that that hot fudge sundae is not as perfect as a hot fudge sundae that is both in your mind and right on the table in front of you. It has a perfection by existing in the world that the imaginary sundae does not have. Well, what does this have to do with God? Well, what St. Anselm is saying is, suppose God exists only in our minds. He's just a figment of our imagination, like the non-existent hot fudge sundae. Well, then that being is not as perfect as a being who existed both in our minds and also in reality. Now, his next step, in effect, is, therefore God exists. Now, it might seem like he's maybe skipping a few steps here. How does he get there? Well, his point is, if we've said that God's the greatest conceivable being, he has every possible perfection, and one perfection is to exist in reality, the greatest conceivable being would have to have that perfection. He would have to exist in reality. Or he wouldn't be the greatest conceivable being if he were only in your mind. But we already agreed that he is. Therefore, God exists. Now, in effect, what St. Anselm is saying is that the existence of God is implied in the very definition of God. Once we unpack that definition, what do we find? We find that his existence is immediately implied. In the same way that if we really understand what the number nine is, then what follows from the definition of nine is that its square root has to be three. Once we fully understood the concept of nine, we understand its square root is three. Well, likewise, once we fully understand the definition of God, we then see that part of his nature is to exist. He has to exist. Now, if you're thinking to yourself, well, I'm not so sure that one works. That seems a little bit slippery. I will point out that most philosophers have, in fact, rejected St. Anselm's proof. In fact, St. Thomas Aquinas rejected St. Anselm's proof, as a matter of fact. But there's always been, in the Western philosophical tradition, a minority tradition that has accepted Anselm's proof. And, uh, in fact, very recently, a a dear friend of mine, uh, Bill Mara, who died in 1998, he taught philosophy at Fordham for decades. And he absolutely believed that Anselm's proof works. But whether you believe it or not, for our purposes, is not so important. What I simply want to show you is that Anselm and other Catholics were committed to the pursuit of truth through human reason. There is nothing scriptural in that argument from St. Anselm. He wanted to show that the human mind could solve this problem. Well, after the break, we're going to see how St. Thomas Aquinas solved this problem, and I think much more persuasively. So join me after the break. Welcome back to The Catholic Church, Builder of Civilization. I'm Thomas Woods. Before the break, we just finished looking at St. Anselm's proof for the existence of God. And if you want to impress your friends, you can refer to it as the ontological proof for the existence of God, and you can sound like a highfalutin philosopher. Not that you would want to, but you can do that. Now, as I said, St. Anselm's proof was rejected by a great many philosophers. Now I'd like to consider one that was offered by St. Thomas Aquinas. But let's first begin with a little bit of background on St. Thomas and his views. Now, St. Thomas lived in the 13th century from about 1225 to 1274. So when you actually, when you consider how young a man he was when he died, his corpus of work becomes all the more impressive. How, How could you possibly have done this? How could you have possibly done it? It calls to mind the statement by St. Isidore of Seville, who once said that anyone who tells you that he's read everything Augustine has written must be a liar. Well, in a way, you almost feel that way about St. Thomas, anyone who's read it all and really, truly absorbed everything. Well, St. Thomas was convinced, as were the typical run of scholastics in his day, that faith and reason could not contradict each other. And St. Thomas believed that our knowledge uh, consisted of three different kinds. For instance, he argued that 
Some of our knowledge we know through divine revelation alone. Some knowledge we know both through divine revelation and through human reason, and still other kinds of knowledge are known through reason alone. So, for example, one piece of information that we have that we know through divine revelation alone would be that God is a trinity, that he's one God in three divine persons. Now, St. Saint, Saint Thomas Aquinas said that this is something we have to know through divine revelation because human reason could never arrive at this conclusion. This is an astonishing mystery. We could never arrive at this conclusion. Now, if I may digress for a moment, I'll point out that some thinkers have tried to claim that human reason can also prove the Trinity. The argument is that if we know that God is love, and we're going to make that something other than just a bumper sticker slogan, God is love, we're really going to take it seriously, then God has to have a threefold nature. Because if he is love, that means we have to have within God the two who love, because love exists between two parties, and then love is fruitful. So there has to be a third party, in effect. There has to be the fruits of that love. That's why some theologians have sometimes pointed to the family, the human family of husband, wife, and child, as in fact imaging the Trinity as a mirror into the divine economy. Economy, of course, in its Greek root, meaning household. Because, in effect, the husband and wife love each other, and the fruit of that love is their child. Well, that's neither here nor there, because the, the consensus is that the Trinity is not something that we can arrive at through strict proof. So that would fall under St. Thomas's first category. The second category, things we can know through divine revelation and through reason, would include, for example, some aspects of the moral law. I suppose reflecting on the subject of murder, just simply reflecting on it honestly, using your mind, you can probably arrive at the conclusion that murder is something people ought not to do. That even if God had never said anything about murder, you could probably draw that as a safe conclusion. Now, God has, of course, told us that we may not commit murder. And St. Thomas a answered the question that you might ask, uh, why would God tell us something that we could just figure out on our own using human reason? And one of St. Thomas's, I think, pretty good arguments in response to that is, the reason he does it is to make our lives a little easier. Because not everybody is a philosopher or has time to sit around 24 hours a day trying to deduce everything in the world through human reason. So God helps us. He tells us things that, yes, we could figure out on our own, but, well, some of us are too busy or blockheaded to do so, basically. The third area of knowledge is knowledge that is known through reason alone. And an example of that would be what causes rainbows. There's nothing in sacred scripture that explains to us what causes rainbows, and there's nothing in sacred tradition that explains it either. That we understand through the rigorous pursuit of reason. Well, now, getting back to St. Thomas, he poses the question whether God exists. Now, as I said, St. Thomas always anticipates his opponent's arguments, and he anticipates all of them. He even comes up with arguments they haven't thought of. So it's very revealing that when St. Thomas is trying to think of all the arguments against the existence of God, how many does he come up with? Only two. One of them is the existence of evil, and the other one is that the universe seems to run itself. It's like we don't need a God. It would be superfluous to po posit the existence of a God. And in some ways, these are very much the same arguments that are still with us today. Well, here's one of St. Thomas's proofs, and I'm sort of adapting it uh, for modern use. But let's begin as follows. Let's suppose you're in the deli, in the supermarket. You want to go up to the deli counter and get some turkey. You go up there, though, and you find that you have to take a number before you can get to the counter and get your turkey. So just as you're about to take your number, you see another device. And this other device says, well, before you can take a number, you have to take a number to get in line to take a number. Well, this is a very disturbing Kafka-esque deli, uh, to be sure. So you're about to take that number, and it turns out there's another number machine. It says, whoa, 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 not so fast. Before you take that number, you have to take a number. So you have